The following podcast contains descriptions of rape, sexual abuse, and murder. Listener discretion is advised. Previously on Families Who Kill, The Donut Shop Murders. The mugshots of Carlin Sherman were part of that bulletin. I knew these people. I was chasing these people. And I said, now Dennis, drop the damn shotgun. And the minute he started leveling down, I popped the cap. And I'm right over the right eye. When if someone shoots a cop, it is seen as being especially dangerous because if a person is crazy enough to shoot a cop, he is capable of doing almost anything. You can call him a psychiatrist. I've done it. I did it to a psychiatrist and to a psychologist. I was declared insane by both of those men. Well, the fact of the matter is that I studied psychology for three years in the penitentiary as part of a college course. Paranoia is the most easy thing in the world to claim. You can fake paranoia so easily. If you were a psychiatrist and I'm sitting here talking to you, and I'm fidgeting all the time, and I'm looking over my shoulder, you know, and all like this, and you may be standing up in a corner with your back to the wall just glaring at it. Blow the psychiatrist's mind, because right away, you know, this guy's a nut. Welcome to the final episode of Families Who Kill, the Donut Shop Murders podcast. We hope you've enjoyed learning about the McCreary-Taylor clan and their twisted saga of murder and mayhem. If enjoy is the right word, we begin right where we left off on May 31st, 1972 in Santa Barbara, California. Carl Taylor has just pulled an epic robbery at the Giordano supermarket where he forced a manager at gunpoint to open a safe and rip through the registers. He netted over $3,000, over 20 grand today a colossal payday for a man with little experience mounting a robbery at such a big venue. But Carl also made some major gaffes. He robbed the place in the broad of day. There were many witnesses. He broke his own three minute rule. And when he exited the store, he found a patrolman lying in wait. All he could think to do was to shoot this cop, Officer Dennis Huddle of the Santa Barbara PD in the head. Officer Huddle was a beloved, hardworking cop who had just gotten married. This was a disaster as Carl brought upon himself the full force of the Santa Barbara Police Department. After the botched robbery, there was an equally bungled getaway. In a manhunt for Carl Taylor, unlike anything he'd ever experienced in his whole life of crime. Here's Detective Fanchuli. I mean, Carl Carl had very poor impulse control. I mean, he could have... He could have walked by that police car, got into his car, and driven away. But he lost it. He saw the police car, and he just immediately assumed he was there responding to the robbery and just walked up and shot him. He didn't act on thought. He acted on impulse, and that was his undoing. As he tried to escape, he had more than Officer Huddle in his path. Two store employees, Kogan and Herman, came after him with a vengeance. Here's Kevin Greenlee from the Murder Sheep podcast. At this point, Jim Kogan, the clerk who called the police, had also been kind of trailing along a little behind Herman. Uh, He sees Taylor and Herman now go back towards the store. So Kogan goes to the fallen police officer. He takes the officer's shotgun. He thinks he's going to go and shoot Taylor. And then he starts following Taylor and Herman back towards the parking lot. At this point, when Taylor reaches the parking lot, he sees a red station wagon. He gets into the station wagon, and a moment later, he gets out again, which seemed like kind of odd behavior. And it would turn out later that what happened was Taylor had driven to the store in the station wagon, and he had deliberately left the car running, thinking that when he came out, he would be able to just hop in and leave, just get out of there as soon as possible, not even needing the second it would take to turn on the car. Unfortunately for Taylor, a good Samaritan had come along, seen that the engine of this car was running, wanted to save somebody some gasoline, so this good Samaritan had reached in, turned off the car, 
and put the key underneath the seat. Taylor, in a panic, when he got into the car later, he didn't realize that's what had happened. And so all he knows is his car is not running. He doesn't know where the key is. So he hops out of the car, and then he sees two people standing by a tan 1965 Buick. So Taylor basically commandeers the vehicle from them. He steals it and drives off. Jim Colgan, the clerk who took the gun from Huddle, sees this, and he starts taking shots at the car. Lieutenant Don Williams, who worked this case for the Santa Barbara PD, arrived on scene shortly after Officer Huddle was gunned down. A good friend of Dennis Huddle, he threw himself into this case with everything he had. So Taylor got completely away. We had some officers taking license plates of all the cars in the parking lot because we figured if he had to hijack a car, he must have left one. One of the officers told me about the red Mustang that the employee had said he tried to get into. We concentrated on that car and ran the license plate and it came back to a law Ford dealer. Talked to a salesman who had sold the car a couple of days before to a Carl Taylor. And he said he was kind of amazed because Taylor pulled out a wad of $100 bills and ripped off 17 of them and drove off in the car. So immediately, Taylor had given the auto dealer a Dallas, Texas address. So that was our first step. We got a hold of Dallas police. They told us there was no such address and they couldn't find any information on the car of Taylor. A week later, I answered a telephone call from an employee of the uh, electric company and he said he had seen a a, a detective from uh, Santa Maria a nearby city had been on his way down to our office with a photograph of a man he suspected of pulling an armed robbery in his city. So we took that picture up to the uh, supermarket and there was nine people being questioned and Seven of them identified the picture of the uh, the suspect, and they were particularly featured on the scar on his the middle of his lip, which was very prominent. Well, as it turned out, after we had had lost any leads, and and then we get the call from the uh, employee. Well, the employee said, "I'm up here in Goleta, and I'm turning on." Uh, electricity in two houses. One of them was rented by a Carl Taylor, and one was rented by a Sherman McCrary. They used their real name when they rented the houses. And of course, that we couldn't get out of the office fast enough on that. We put a surveillance team on the Mc- Taylor house and got a search warrant. Anya Kane from the murder sheet. So meanwhile, Taylor goes back to the McCrary house. Uh, this is where they, they all hang out. Um, his wife, Ginger, is there. She's passed out on the floor, but I guess comes to when he walks in the room and notices that he has a bunch of scratches on his arm. That's where the glass cut him when the, the passenger side window was shattered by Kogan's shot. And she asks him what happened. Um, he snaps back at her to shut up. She didn't need to know. Um, then he, when they go in the back room together, he says that they've got to get out of there, basically. They need to flee Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara is actually where this uh, McCrary taylor clan kind of moved recently. They uprooted from Athens, Texas, and moved to Santa Barbara, and are actually living in a comparatively nice neighborhood. And uh, this is their new, this is their new place. You can kind of imagine what's going through Carl Taylor's mind at this point. I mean, he he's pretty much veered from the typical M.O. of the robberies. You know, typically they're going to smaller places at night that are isolated, typically only have one employee uh, to deal with and getting pretty small takes. It seems like he got a big head and thought he might uh, go for a you know, a daytime robbery at a fancy grocery store in Santa Barbara, California during the day, even though that would mean that 
you know, he'd have to wrangle all these different employees and customers and, and police would likely show up. So uh, it's kind of a miscalculation on his part. So he stashes the car he stole in the garage of Sherman McCrary with Sherman's knowledge. And then he and Ginger take off. They go down to Texas where they were, will stay with uh, Carl's mother. Now, at this point, the police start tracing the, the ownership of this red car that Carl had abandoned when he fled. And they find that it was purchased by a woman named Ginger McCrary Taylor. They don't find any listing in the records for a Ginger McCrary Taylor living there. But they do a little bit more investigation, and the power company reports they recently had turned on power at a new address for a Ginger McCrary Taylor. So they go to that address, and they find the stolen car in the garage there, and they also find some evidence that uh, suggests that Ginger has relatives living nearby, which would be Sherman and Sherman's wife, and they go there and... They uh, talk with Sherman and his family, and they become suspicious of them, and they end up arresting them, and Sherman and Carolyn tell them that they believe that Carl and Ginger have gone to Texas. The Taylor house had this door open, all the lights on, and the television set going, so we assumed that they were in there. But after not seeing any kind of movement for a couple of hours, we entered the house and it was empty no personal property at all so then we went out and opened the garage door and lo and behold there was the uh, hijacked car with its windows blown out so we knew we had the right guy so then we went down to the second house that McCrary had rented and Car Carolyn his wife let us in the house and she said uh, Sherman was drunk and back in bed. So I went back into the bedroom and woke Sherman up. And I told him, I said, a son-in-law of yours just robbed a uh, grocery store. And he said, that dumb SOB, I told him he didn't have the brains to plan something like that. And I said, well, he, w he wasn't too dumb. He got $3,000 and Sherman's eyes flew open and I said that he was dumb enough to shoot a police officer. So I had an interrogation with him right there in his bedroom and he started telling me about what they'd been doing. And actually they had just robbed a grocery store lock away after they rented those houses. So we arrested him and his wife and their 19 year old son. Problem was his daughter, Ginger, who was Carl Taylor's wife, was gone and they were taking care of her two little kids. So we had to call in the protective service and have the kids taken into custody. Sherman told me that Carl was gone and the house was empty. He, he said he probably was headed for Athens, Texas. That was his home. And uh, Carolyn and Danny also remembered that before he left, Carl mentioned that he'd shot a cop. So at this point, the family must know that the, the jig is pretty much up. So then the uh, police find Carl and Ginger in Texas, and they are arrested there. Carl was actually arrested in the home of his mother. When if someone shoots a cop, it is seen as being especially dangerous because that if a person is crazy enough to shoot a cop, he is capable of doing almost anything. So it had been two or three days, of course, before we had discovered the Taylor house, and he had plenty of time to drive to Athens. So we called the Athens Police Department and gave them the name of the people that he would probably be staying with, and they went over there, and Carl hid in the closet and wouldn't come out. So this, this old boy, he went around to the side of the house, pounded on the side of it where the closet had an outside uh, wall, and he said, uh, yeah, I'm going to give you two minutes to come out or I'm going to be shooting my shotgun right through this wall. So old Taylor came out in two minutes, and they were arrested and they were taken before a judge, he and Ginger, and they waived extradition. So me and my lieutenant 
and a female police officer went to Athens and took them into custody and brought them back. Uh, Carl wouldn't talk to us, but Sherman couldn't keep his mouth shut, and neither could his wife. And as a result, Sherman and Carl was charged with robbery and Carl with uh, assault. And they both pled guilty right away. And uh, we were released Carl to Colorado because he had, they had a murder case on him. We put Sherman up in Folsom Prison. And that pretty much ended our association with him. And, and the undoing in Santa Barbara was Sherman's drinking and the fact that Carl got tired of, of thinking that he was carrying Sherman's load. And he went out and pulled that Giordano's robbery by himself and screwed up. These guys were pretty effective as a duo, but by themselves, they, they weren't very good at all. They needed each other. I, I, I don't think that the sexual crimes, that the murders, rapes and murders of the women, I don't think that ever would have happened if either of these guys was solo. It was whatever that chemistry was that occurred when they got together that, um, that brought this on. When that flyer came up from Dallas about Carl and Sherman being arrested for the supermarket robbery in Santa Barbara and the fact that they've been traveling around the country and may be responsible for other crimes in multiple jurisdictions. I looked at that bulletin and looked at those pictures and I'm like, holy oh, shit, the light came on, you know? And the next thing was, you know, rushing over to the crime lab. And what was so crazy about it was I had Carl and Sherman's fingerprints in the files of the crime lab from 1970 from the check case because I ordered them up from Texas. And they were sitting in a file cabinet right next to the file cabinet that had the latent fingerprints that were lifted off the donut shop cup. There, but there, there it was, sitting there in the crime lab the suspects, the evidence. Joe Fanchuli, a Colorado cop, is setting up a few big ideas with this statement. One is that there are several jurisdictions where Carl and Sherman had committed robbery and murder, meaning that multiple states would step up to bring them to justice. Florida, Texas, Kansas, Oregon. But he's also positing that Colorado may have the best evidence to convict between the prints lifted off the coffee mug, witness statements, and dead-on sketches. And in the end, there was a consensus among the states that the most important thing was to get these two men off the highways forever. After the Giordano's robbery and ensuing manhunt in Texas, Lieutenant Don Williams brought Carl to California, where he and Sherman were convicted of armed robbery and attempted murder of a police officer. Both were sentenced to five to life, Carl at St. Quentin Prison and Sherman at Folsom, both rough and crime-ridden institutions. However, led by a fierce prosecutor named Bob Miller, Colorado extradited Carl and Sherman to Colorado to have them face the music for the murder of 20-year-old Lior Looney in August of 1971. But smuggling Carl to Colorado took time, ingenuity. Here's Finn Shuley. They were trying to decide, you know, where to extradite him. And the Texas people were putting a lot of pressure on California to let them have him, let them have Carl. Carl was convinced that he would never live, he would never make it alive to Texas, that they would kill him. They would say he tried to escape and they would kill him on, on the way to Texas. So I get called into Brooks's office and, you know, my partner and I, Roger Willard, um, we get sent out to San Quentin to see what we could do to convince Carl to waive extradition and come to Colorado. Because the, oh, that's the only way we were going to get him if he waived extradition. Brooks calls, calls me into the office and he says, you've got to go to California, you've got to go to San Quentin, you've got to do something, but you've got to get Carl Taylor back here. And he hands me these tickets and he says, go out there and get him. And if you don't come back with him, don't come back. <laughs> okay, chief. So I'm obsessed with online shopping. I've got tabs open all day long. I got like shoes, hair products. I'm trying to find the best refrigerator. When you go to checkout, you always see that box that says promo code. And you're like, what promo? I need a promo code, right? Well, now... I have found a way to save you tons of money because it has saved me hundreds of dollars. It's unbelievable. This company is called Honey. 
Honey is the free browser extension that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Honey supports over 30,000 stores online, tech, gaming products, popular fashion brands, and even food delivery. I saved $25 off dog food. It, it was unbelievable. Honey, you've done it again. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. By getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. I'd never recommend something I don't use. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash FWK. That's joinhoney.com slash FWK. Who's ready to feel amazing this year? Sunbasket delivers healthy meals so you aren't on the hook to shop and cook to hit your healthy goals. Whether you eat vegetarian, paleo, gluten-free, low-carb, high-protein, Sunbasket has something to check any and every box. You can put dinner on autopilot with easy-to-prep meal kits that impress for date night or win over that picky eater in your family. This is what's so cool about Sunbasket as well. So my wife will like one thing, and then I'll like another thing, and we get to eat Two different things, like we're out at a restaurant for dinner. We just pick and choose what we want. You open that up, you heat it and eat it in minutes. That's it. Sunbasket has weekly delivery. And guess what? If you're like, hey, I want to skip this week because I'm going to be out of town for four out of the seven days. You can skip it. It's so simple and easy. You will love it. Right now, Sunbasket is offering $90 off and a free gift when you order. Go to sunbasket.com slash FWK and enter promo code FWK at checkout. That's sunbasket.com slash FWK and enter promo code FWK. Here's Bob Miller, the DA from Well County, Colorado. Only in his 20s at the time, he was leading the state's case against the McCrary's. He'd later go on to become the U.S. attorney for Colorado and a local legal legend. It was basically the defendant's decision, not law enforcement's decision. And Joe and Roger happened to be Johnny on the spot to be there at the right time and escort him right out of prison and put him on the plane and got him out here. What it came down to is we were first. It was a very unusual twist, and it wasn't an agreement uh, with the jurisdictions as it sometimes is. So we, we get, get to San Francisco, we rent a car, we drive out to San Quentin, we get in. We're here to we're here to see Carl Taylor. We're here to we're here to try to, to take him back to Colorado, and and they bring Carl down, and Carl thinks he's going to Texas. And he's got this stark look of fear on his face. And he walks in and he he sees us and he sees me. And he says, you guys aren't from Texas. And the, the booking sergeant behind the desk has got a body slip. And it basically says, release the body of Carl Taylor to officers of the state of Texas, blah, 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 blah. And I'm looking at this piece of paper and I'm looking at Carl and I'm like, there's something wrong with this piece of paper. It says Texas. We're going to Colorado. And I looked at Carl and I said, Carl, you don't want to go to Texas, do you? You, you, you want to come to Colorado, right? And he goes, yeah, I want to go with you guys. <laughs> So I crossed out the word Texas, and I wrote in the word Colorado, and I signed the paperwork, and we get Carl, and we get him in the in the rental car, and latch him down in the back seat, and we start to head out the gates of San Quentin, and we stopped outside the gates, and Carl was chained up in the back seat, and I was in the passenger seat, and Willard was in the driver's seat, and we basically said to Carl, either you behave and you do what you're told, or we'll shoot you right here if you try to escape. And I'll never forget the look on Carl's face, shackled up in the back seat of that car. He, he knew. He knew. And off we went to San Francisco airport. We bring him up the steps. Once we get on that airplane, the pilot comes back and he looks at Carl and he said, I know who this is. And he said, I'll, I'll allow you to have him on the plane, but I will secure him. The pilot takes the seat out, the C 
seat cushion out that he would use as a flotation device. He takes the belly chain that's wrapped around Carl. He says, he can't be handcuffed on the plane, but there's no law that says I can't handcuff him to the seat. He wraps the belly chain around Carl and he clips the handcuffs to the structure of the seat on the plane, puts the cushion back down, and Carl sits down, and I sit next to him, and we fly back to Denver, and that is the flight where Carl develops what I call verbal diarrhea. He couldn't shut up. He talked to me all the way back, and I never asked him any questions. I just kept him talking, and he talked through the entire flight and talked about the loony case, and eventually that confession, as soon as we got back to the department, as soon as we got got back that night and, and, and got him booked, I, I went straight to a typewriter and typed from memory everything he said to me, and we used that in the case, and that went up to the Supreme Court in, in Colorado. His attorneys tried to get that confession squashed that I didn't Mirandize him and this and that and the other thing, and uh, it didn't fly. Uh, the Supreme Court basically said, I never asked him a question. He just talked. So he talked and I listened. And that, that's that's how that piece went. He's basically giving a description of what occurred and attributing the worst of it to Sherman. Not denying that he was there because he can't, but basically laying blame off on Sherman. You know, Sherman made me do it kind of thing. After the plea agreement, Nolan Brown, who was the, the other prosecutor on the case, he and I had to take Carl to Texas so that he could plead guilty to the two murders, the, the, the Covey murders and the Shaw murder, get his life sentence for that, and then bring him back to Colorado. And we get on this American Airlines plane at Stapleton Airport, and the pilot of that plane comes back. Now, by now, this had been all over the news media and everything. The pilot of that plane comes back, and he says, I, I, I don't know that I want this guy on my plane. He's, he's murdered 12 people. And I'm like, no, he hasn't. And he goes, I, listen, I've seen the news media. I've seen the stories. This guy's, this guy's murdered 12 women. And I looked at Carl, and I said, Carl, have you murdered anybody? And he says, no. <laughs> and I said, there you go. He didn't murder anybody. And the <laughs> pilot just laughed, and he walked back and went up and got in the cockpit, and off we went to Dallas. But Carl was so scared on that, on that trip that he would not let me away from him. I sat in a holding cell with him at the Dallas County Jail because he was afraid that if I left him alone in that holding cell, they would kill him. So I, I had the pleasure of sitting in the holding cell in the same area where Lee Harvey Oswald was, waiting for Carl to go up to court, do his plea, and go back to the airport and fly back to Denver. At long last, after a year-long devastating saga, it was time for Carl and Sherman to face justice for their killing spree. A few weeks after Carl was ushered out of St. Quentin Prison, Sherman followed suit and was extradited from Folsom to join his son-in-law in the Colorado courts. As a prelude to their trial, the two men had struck what's called a cleanup agreement with all the other jurisdictions where they were wanted for murder, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Utah, Nevada, Texas, and Florida. They pled guilty and were issued concurrent life sentences in Texas and Florida, bringing a modicum of closure to the families of Sherry Martin, Suzanne Shaw, Liz Perryman, Forrest and Jenna Covey, Bobby and Valerie Turner, and Cynthia Glass. But this proceeding in Colorado would become the primary vehicle for convicting them in a court of law. First was the question of what to do with the women, who were certainly complicit in the crimes, but to what extent it was hard to prove. Liz McCrary pleaded guilty to being an accessory after the fact to murder and was sentenced to two years in the county lockup. Ginger avoided murder charges, but got hit with three years for passing bad checks. Here's Anya and Kevin. And then the matriarch of the family, Carolyn McCrary, she was sentenced to two years in jail. She pled guilty uh, for accessory after the fact in the Looney case. Um, and Ginger ended up, even though she was immune with all the murders, she ended up in legal trouble because uh, she was constantly writing bad checks. So in Colorado, uh, she got three to five years on a bad check charge. Ultimately, she was convicted of writing 33 bad checks for an amount totaling over $1,400. And apparently her involvement with this family 
um, ended up extending her sentence in that case because the judge was aware of her past criminal associations. So as far as the legal proceedings that would follow the capture of the McCrary Taylors, Ginger probably got the best deal out of any member of the family. Uh, she was actually granted full immunity in exchange for her testimony to uh, the grand, a grand jury. So uh, she ended up not serving any time for any sort of accessory to murder or participation in the murders in any way. And uh, some might say that that was too lenient, but that was the decision that the prosecutors made in this. And uh, so she would be kind of filling in a lot of the details about what happened for the grand jury. Because there were so many jurisdictions involved in this, it seems like different prosecutors sort of wanted to take a crack at the McCrary Taylor family and, and wanted to be able to hold them accountable for the murders that occurred in their area. But it would sort of play out where some murders ended up being put on trial and then others sort of didn't really get adjudicated. Yeah, often in cases such as this, where the offenders have committed a long list of crimes, prosecutors make a decision. You know, they can only serve so many life sentences. So you, you pick your two or three best cases. And then after that, you, you make a deal. Uh, one thing you often do is you get the defendants to make what is called a cleanup statement where in return for not being prosecuted, the defendant will make a statement about all the other crimes he committed. And so uh, Taylor uh, made a cleanup statement admitting his guilt in some of the murders in which he ended up not being prosecuted for. And the murder that both McCrary and Taylor ended up being prosecuted for ended up being that of Leora Looney. Uh, the 20 year old they kidnapped in Colorado. Um, so both men were extradited from California to Colorado and uh, they waived their extradition rights. And basically, there was a lot of publicity on this case, just given how heinous these crimes were, that's not terribly surprising, but that did end up being a factor in the, in the legal proceedings because McCrary's defense argued that the family was basically, you know, toxic in terms of the public opinion on them. Articles in the press connected to them to, to as many as 22 murders. They even cited one where it was unfavorable personality profiles of the entire family talking about what creeps they were. And they argued that this was prejudicial to any potential jury and that, you know, the whole thing was basically tainted. Among other motions, Sherman McCrary filed to have the trial moved to a different county because of excess pretrial publicity. The motion was denied. Here's Bob Miller again, the DA from Weld County, Colorado, who prosecuted the Leora Looney case. Here I am less than a year in the office, the youngest DA in the state's history and I've got a serial killer on my hand. So we started started figuring out what, how we were going to handle it, and there were issues associated with it, like she was taken in Lakewood, which is a county other than the county of where Greeley is situated. So the question, legal questions like, where was a crime committed? She was obviously kidnapped from Lakewood. She was robbed in Lakewood. But where was she raped and where was she murdered? So we started talking about what is the proper jurisdiction? Is it Lakewood, which is Jefferson County, the county just west of Denver, or is it Weld County, where Greeley is, which is about 60 miles north of there? <laughs> so we started talking to the attorney general's office. I started talking to the uh, DA in Jefferson County, Nolan Brown, about just mechanically, how do we do this? So those were the things going on. You get really involved. In, you know, part of the reason I loved what I was doing is I felt like I was contributing to society. And one of the one of the things, you, one of the ways you contribute to society as a prosecutor is to keep these people from continuing to commit these heinous crimes against others in the community. So that was certainly at the top of my mind. Uh, you know, if we had a if we had a roving band of killers out there, we needed to get them off the street. 
and in prison or the death penalty, which is what I originally wanted to do with these folks. One thing the prosecution team encountered early on was that Carl and Sherman had completely turned on each other, with each man laying the blame on the other for the kidnappings and murders. Each guy conceded that he was there at the scene of the murders, but said that the other man had pulled the trigger. The divide between these once close men was suddenly very vast. With no way of proving who did what, the court agreed to what's called a severance, a separate and fair trial for each defendant, Carl and Sherman. Finally, we agreed to give them separate trials because we we did think that we had some problems because of the conflicting statements, each blaming the other. If we tried them together, that would not work. Finally, decided we'd try Sherman first, and we tried him, and we successfully prosecuted him and convicted him. I watched him carefully all the time we were in court with him, and in my view, Sherman was the more passive of the two, and I think not the brightest of the two. I think Carl had a temper. I think he was the more assertive of the two, and I'm virtually certain he was the smartest of the two. (laughs) But, you know, you had Sherman who was older uh, and the father-in-law. You'd think naturally maybe Carl would defer some to Sherman. And sometimes you'd see a deferral and sometimes you wouldn't. I always felt that um, Carl, Carl was the guy with the ideas and Sherman was the follower. Sherman's trial was swift and decisive, despite Sherman's repeated assertions that Carl was the bad guy who raped Leora and ultimately pulled the trigger. Bob Miller and the prosecution wove an inescapable web around the defendant. Weld County Sheriff's deputies, the medical examiner, Colorado Bureau of Investigation detective, a lab tech, and eyewitnesses at the donut shop all took the stand. The evidence was a vice grip, and Sherman was found guilty of kidnapping and murder. He got a life sentence. Carl's case was a bit trickier. He claimed he was not guilty by reason of insanity. Specifically, he was insane at the precise moment of shooting Leora Looney, and he had two state-appointed psychiatrists who backed his claim. Could this cold, calculating man who wrote poetry and read Greek mythology successfully mount this defense? Here's Bob Miller again. When I first learned that Carl Taylor had changed his plea from not guilty to not guilty by reason of insanity, the one thing we knew was that Carl... Carl was a really street smart guy and he'd been in prison before and he he knew the ropes and we we were pretty sure he was trying to pull a fast one. We also thought, given his ability to con people, which they had made a livelihood doing, <laughs> that he would be able to maybe con some psychiatrist into believing that he indeed was insane. What is an insanity plea exactly? What must the defense prove in order for the plea to stick? Here's the world-renowned forensic psychologist, Lewis Schlesinger. What does that mean exactly, uh, insanity? Uh, The legal standard for insanity for most of the jurisdictions in the United States is based on an old English case of a guy named Daniel McNaughton. It's called the McNaughton Rule. And in 1843, Daniel McNaughton had a disorder that today we would easily diagnose as paranoid schizophrenia or paranoid psychosis. He had a delusional belief that the political party in England, the Tory party, was persecuting him. And he was very delusional and and, and very, very psychotic. And so he got a gun and the prime minister of England at that time, his name was Robert Peel, was making a political speech and McNaughton took his gun out, tried to assassinate him because Peel was the head of the Tory party who McNaughton believed was persecuting him. And he missed uh, missed Peel and shot uh, Peel's press secretary, a guy named Drummond. And they arrested McNaughton, and the English court then wrote what has become known as the McNaughton Rule. And that's the legal standard for insanity. And here's the McNaughton Rule. It's first you have to have a defect of reason from disease of mind, meaning you have to have a mental disorder, a disease of mind, that causes a defect of reason, meaning there's something defective about your reasoning. But then the McNaughton Rule goes on to say, 
but it can't be any old defect of reason because all kinds of people see all sorts of different, see things very, very differently and think different things. It has to be a defect of reason to the extent that you do not know the nature and quality of your acts, meaning that when you shot the person or killed the person, you didn't know what you were doing. And, but even if you did know what you were doing, which in most cases the individual did know the nature and quality of his acts, you could still meet the McNaughton standard if you did not know that what you were doing was wrong. And so if you have a mental illness like McNaughton and you think that the political party is persecuting you and you shoot your persecutor in a self-defensive way and you didn't think it was wrong, you thought it was right, Legally, you could be found not criminally responsible, not morally responsible. Keep in mind also, insanity, legal insanity, is not a medical, psychiatric, or psychological diagnosis. It's a jury decision. It's a judgment from the community. Should we hold this individual morally responsible, legally responsible for what he did? They make the decision, not the mental health person. The jury makes the decision. And, uh, and, and so they'll make a decision based on all the testimony they heard, the facts, the expert testimony, and then using their own common sense. A jury has over 500 years of life experience. So when you look at the average age of the average juror and multiply it by 12, it's going to come over 500 years. It's very difficult to fool a jury, because they have too much life experience. They're not going to get confused by experts with all sorts of jargon and, and, and everything else. They're usually going to get it right. Sometimes the jury gives a defendant too much. Sometimes he gives them a little bit less than what they deserve. Usually, for most cases, they get it uh, basically correct. Um, so you can be psychotic, you can be delusional, but you may not meet the legal standard for insanity because no matter how psychotic you are, if you knew that what you were doing was wrong, and that can be implied or inferred by what the defendant did. For example, if he runs from the crime scene and hides the weapon, it shows consciousness of guilt and an awareness of the wrongfulness of his behavior. Julie Rendleman is one of the premier criminal defense attorneys in New York City. The insanity defense is usually used in cases where the person in terms of the crime itself is pretty dead to rights. So, um, it, it, you know, where you're basically saying, yes, I did it, but I didn't, I'm not responsible because of X, Y, and Z. Um, so you're right. Yeah, that is usually the time that that's going to go down that road um, with it. You often see it also in like um, death penalty cases, you know, where they're either they'll try to get the insanity defense during the guilt phase or during the sentencing phase itself, the, the death penalty phase, you'll hear um, a lot of testimony from the defense in many cases uh, about uh, maybe not the insanity defense, but mitigation, um, whether it be, you know, I've heard, you know, their brain, the, the brain of the defendant looks different um, because of what happened when he was a child, you know, things like that, that try to mitigate um, or, or present the jury with the possibility of not um, going with the death sentence must not be all there, right? We, we all assume that, but that doesn't mean it rises to the level of not being responsible for the crime. And, it, and so that's the delineation between the two. You can be, uh, I hate using, I don't want to use the word crazy, um, but mentally ill, but still be responsible. I mean, there's a difference between someone who believes that when they're committing the crime, they're really not committing a crime. They, they believe that, you know, uh, I don't know, UFOs have come down um, and have made them do this, something, something like that, um, which would, you know, you know, be a stronger indication of someone who's not necessarily responsible for their acts. And I think one of the things you look for when you're deciding if someone is um, is not responsible, and, and again, there's so many factors that go into it, but one of the things you look for is um, 
basically, you know, is this someone that thought out the acts they committed? So keep in mind in this case, these are people that like would take someone at a time when no one else was present to make sure that no one caught them. They would dispose of the body in a way that they were hoping no one would find them. They would leave behind very little evidence and they would take money and use that money. These are that to me is an indication of someone that thought out what they wanted, was was clear in their mind as to what they wanted and and had the the mental capacity to know it was important to dispose of the body so that it was difficult to find because they wanted to avoid being arrested. Um, and, and by the way, the fact that they killed the person because they didn't want to witness is another indication that this person knew very well right from wrong. For Carl, this whole insanity plea was just another in a long list of grifts and cons, which he admitted in his prison testimony in 1974. The recordings were very degraded, so we hired an actor to bring them to life. Probably now, uh, as a man since in front of him, he can probably come pretty close, but I don't think there's any man alive who can reach back in time and say that any particular moment that anybody was crazy. Uh, and I don't know what it is. I believe anybody that has any uh, kind of reason, any degree of logic can be the psychiatrist. You can call in a psychiatrist. I've done it. I did it to a psychiatrist and to a psychologist. I was declared insane by both of those men. Well, it's a uh, it's kind of complicated thing at first. Uh, well, the fact of the matter is that I studied psychology for three years in the penitentiary as part of a college course. I had three years of college. It's a uh, you study it whenever you're studying psychology. You study how a psychotic. Well, schizophrenic, uh, paranoia is the most easiest thing in the world to claim. You can fake paranoia so easily, uh, like, right now, all I gotta do is sit here, you know? If you were a psychiatrist, and I'm sitting here talking to you, and I'm fidgeting all the time, and I'm looking over my shoulder, you know, and all like this, and, you know, you become excessively nervous. Yeah, you just, you build it up in your own mind. In other words, start taking yourself on a trip. You may be standing up in a corner with your back to the wall just glaring at him. Just blow the psychiatrist's mind because right away, you know, this guy's a nut. Uh, paranoia. There's a lot of paranoids walking around on the street and not necessarily insane, but they can become insane awfully quickly. It's a new year. It's 2022 and everyone's making New Year's resolutions. All the people I talk to, they're like, oh, I got that big one and all these big ones. And I'm like, I know what's going to happen. In like three or four weeks, they're going to call and they're just going to be completely off of it. So let me tell you something that is actually manageable for a New Year's resolution. I want to talk to you about Talkspace. Talkspace personally matches you with a licensed therapist you can connect with right from your phone. You get access to a private virtual room with just you and your therapist. You can send messages 24 hours a day, seven days a week. No need to wait for a weekly appointment. Talkspace's encryption and added security features keep your conversation fully protected. I'm telling you, I've done it. It works. Talkspace makes it easy to get the help you need to make lasting progress with your mental health all year round. Make your mental health more than just a New Year's resolution with Talkspace. Visit Talkspace.com and get $100 off your first month when you use promo code FWK at sign up. That's $100 off at Talkspace.com, promo code FWK. This time, the jury didn't fall for Carl's ruse. They declared him sane and fit to stand trial. But here's the paradox with insanity, please. You're admitting you committed the crime with the caveat that you were not of sound mind when you did so. 
But once the insanity plea is tossed, the prosecution has you cornered. Checkmate. Maybe he was a sociopath, maybe even a psychopath, definitely deeply antisocial. But he was, the jury said, sane at the time of Leora Looney's murder. Shortly after the ruling, Carl pled guilty to first-degree murder in the state of Colorado, bringing his long, bloodthirsty, abominable saga to an end. The McCrary Taylors would no longer haunt the American highways ever again and never set foot in another donut shop. The McCrary Taylors murder spree lasted over a year, spanned eight states, and claimed up to 22 victims, making them among the most prolific serial killing families. Carl and Sherman both received life sentences for felony murder. Sherman's wife, Carolyn, got two years for being an accessory to murder. Ginger got three years for passing bogus checks. Danny was convicted of the murder of Jenna and Forrest Covey and drew a life sentence in Texas. And like that, the killer family was taken off the map. To this day, Carl is in the Colorado Territorial Correctional Facility. He's 83 years old. Sherman is dead. He killed himself in 1988 at the Fremont Correctional Facility in Canyon City, Colorado. Well, how did this end? Sherman killed himself. He hung himself in his uh, jail cell in prison. He said he was, uh, wrote a note saying, I'm tired of doing time. I'm not surprised at all at that. I, I'm really not. Why is that? Because these people hate themselves. They're not happy and carefree people running around, happy, stealing, raping, just living a carefree, happy-go-lucky life. No, that's, that's not even close to what it is. These are angry, miserable people. They hate themselves. They hate everybody around them. They're just filled with anger and hate. And if you look at the, 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 the life pattern of all these characters, particularly Sherman and uh, Carl, they leave nothing but a trail of misery everywhere they, they go in life. Um, and, and so the fact that he killed himself in prison doesn't surprise me at all. It, it really, really doesn't. So I think for me, what the McCreary Taylor case just drives home is, I, I mean, this is, I guess this is a cliche, but just how awful human beings can be to one another oh, over nothing. Um, I mean, this was, it, it, it's just, it's sort of the worst of humanity, uh, what, what you see here going on and that this family sort of worked in concert to perpetuate and also enable these crimes is just, it's pretty, it's pretty depressing. Um, and I think hopefully what, what people can, can learn from uh, a case like this where it, it's so brutal on its face, it's, it, there's nothing, it, it, it's, just, it's just basically people going around the country using brutality to cow victims and then doing awful things to them and killing them. And, and that's, that's, that's what, that's what it is. It's a nasty little story and there's, there's no, there's no glamour in it. I think sometimes we, we kind of almost think of, yeah, of, of these cases of uh, mysteries or murders as almost like a glamorous kind of thing where, you know, it might be some mysterious serial killer who's smarter than the cops and getting away with it. And I, I think more crimes are, are like this. There's nothing glamorous about it. It's just disgusting and awful. And when you're willing to use force and violence to get people to comply, you know, you you have an advantage and, and, and that that can help you get away with crimes for a while, even even if you're freaking idiots like these people. <laughs> Because these these were not these were not smart individuals. These were not sophisticated individuals. They just were violent, nasty, and they didn't care about anything other than gratifying their own base desires and getting some money while they were doing it. So, I I think I would just it, it, I think the McCrary Taylor case is just a great reminder for us to not glorify murderers. I'm not happy that all those girls were killed, but I was happy that I had the opportunity to uh, put a stop to it. I think both Carl Taylor and Sherman McCrary had not gone as far in life as they wanted to and likely felt they had been abused or given hard knocks by the system. And so sometimes when a person feels that way or feels powerless, 
they uh, then get off on exhibiting power and demonstrating power over other people. But of course, there's lots of people who feel powerless who don't do that. Uh, at one point, uh, Sherman McCrary did say, this is a, a quote, he said, I studied psychology and know a little bit, and you can mistreat a dog just so long until it becomes really mean. And what he was trying to suggest there was that he was, in essence, the creation of society. In short, that society and the prison system had treated him so badly that it made him mean. Uh, obviously, I just feel that's uh, an excuse and that doesn't hold any water at all, and it's a rationalization. But when we start asking why people do things, it's interesting to see what explanations they offer themselves. And his was pretty poor. Sherman was pretty much a dumbass, a small-time screw-up. Carl was a small-time screw-up. When these guys got together, there was a chemistry between them of, of one trying to outdo the other. And they escalated from the check fraud to the arm robberies. And then at... at at, at some point, they walked into that Winchell's Donut Shop in Salt Lake City and saw Sherry Martin. And just robbing the donut shop became, let's take the girl. And the sexual piece of it started. I'm not proud of myself. No, I'm not proud of myself, not a bit. Uh, any man that would be proud of anything of that nature uh, is one of two things. Either he's a damn fool or he's crazy. He's got to be crazy. I have to live with what I have done. I'm going to have to pay for what I've done by being locked up. And I've got to think about that the rest of my life. This is the point. I've got to live with it. I don't think that I'm sociopathic or anti-social. I don't think that my sociopathic tendencies are any more than Pierce's or Joe's as far as that goes. Uh, because I do have a conscience. Well, I think what my main point was that Sherman brought on something that uh, I would have never conceived doing in my mind because I've never, I've never been that violent. Uh, I'm not a passive man, passive. I've spent too much time in the penitentiary and jail and this and that to be passive, but I don't care whether you believe I have some kind of moral values or not. I do have some. I do have scruples of a sort, and I have my own code of ethics that I live by, and I didn't live by them. Uh, I think my biggest problem is I got too involved with Ginger, and I let this dominate my mind. I went along with her father to keep her. Like I say, I've done a little bit of everything. I've been hot checks, burglar, everything else. But the first person I had ever been involved or seen die was that girl in Salt Lake City. And I can, uh, I know what it did to me. Uh, and I have to think it would be the same for any rationally sane man. But it didn't affect Sherman. There was no indication of that at all. But I tell you what, I threw up. I got sick and I threw up. And I'm sick to this day. Um, one day, probably about 20 years ago, when I was with one of the big law firms I was with, it, I always took all my calls, and I got a call one day from this person who said he was Glenn somebody, and I didn't know who it was, and he said, do you know who I am? And I said, no. And finally, he said, "Does do the names McCrary and Taylor mean anything to you? And I said, whoa, <laughs> yes, I do remember them. And he said, well, I'm one of the kids. And I had remembered that when they when they got arrested in, uh, for this, that we're talking about Looney case, that there were two young kids under, under the age of three, I believe, that may or may not have been in the car. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
that they were put up for adoption. And this kid went on to tell me that he indeed had been adopted after this happened. He was living in, I think, West Virginia. He, and he was a, an electrician, I believe, or a plumber, and said he'd had great adoptive parents and he had had a good life, but he was looking for his parents. And he, of course, he, and he had come across our book and he had called my old DA's office and they had given him my number. And of course, I started thinking, what, does this guy want to come and get me or something for what we did to his father and grandfather? And uh, he said, no, he, he really was just interested in whether or not his mother, Ginger, was involved in all this. And I said, well, you, you'll have to ask her. I mean, we don't really know to this day whether or not she was, but you'll have to ask her. And he said, well, I've, I've tracked her down and I've got a meeting with her. I believe he said in Kansas City in a couple of weeks. And um, I never, uh, and he told me his, his brother he had found him, and he had also been adopted, and it was in a neighboring state there, I think. And he, too, had good adopted parents and had done well, but they were both now on this quest to reunite with the parents, and particularly the mother. And so I, I left it at that, but he did indeed come to Greeley, and uh, the local newspaper, the Greeley Tribune, the crime reporter there hooked up with him and took him on a tour of where the murder site was and up to the Cheyenne Hotel where they stayed after the murder and and uh, apparently retraced uh, the steps of the, the crime spree. Um, but that's the last I had any contact in the case, but it was, a, it was an eerie contact to be sure. <laughs> Families Who Kill the Donut Shop Murders is a production of Trooper Entertainment and Wondery. It is executive produced by Dave Kaplan, Randy Tatt, and Alan Weeder. Written by Alan Weeder. Co-executive produced, narrated, and edited by James Carroll. Supervising producer is Michael Wiley. Consulting producer is Detective Joe Finchuli. Ethan Darbone is the voice of Carl Taylor. Special thanks to Mark Turner and A3 Artists Agency. Mixed and mastered by Wildwoods Picture and Sound. Theme song and scoring is by Nick O'Leary and Hush Empire. Additional music is from the Jingle Punks Library. Additional production by Lily Williner. Cover art by Teenage Stepdad. If you have questions or information about the McCrary case, feel free to email us at donutshopmurders at gmail.com. It helps a lot when you subscribe, rate, and review the podcast you enjoy. Thank you for your support. 